This lecture is meant as an introduction to your parts three and four of the water cycle lab, um, which involve glaciers. There are two primary types of glaciers, and the first is the by far the largest. And those are called continental glaciers or ice sheets. So currently on the earth, there are two ice sheets that still remain. There is the Greenland ice sheet, which is obviously over Greenland. And then there is the Antarctic ice sheet, which is over the continent of Antarctica in the South Pole. Um, what's true though, is the Greenland ice sheet is the remains of a much larger ice sheet that used to cover um, pretty much further, as far south as the Pennsylvania border in New York state, and then much of the Midwestern United States, um, all of Canada and parts of Europe and um, Russia as well. What's fun about continental ice sheets is their size. They're absolutely massive. They cover continents and they behave much like pancake batter and that there is a zone where they're thickest and then they flow out from the center. Um, so they sort of slump out in all directions, kind of moving downhill. So continental glaciers are really important to the formation of the landscapes in New York state, especially. Um, but really most of the Northeastern United States, and in fact, most of our country. And the features that are created by continental glaciers that you're going to see in maps today are largely depositional. When we have our virtual field trip in a couple weeks and we are going to um, Menden Ponds Park, you will be able to see some of these features um, as we kind of go pro around the park. But for today, you're gonna to see them on topographic maps. One of the first features that are created by uh, continental glaciers are called drumlins. So drumlins are these long sort of spoon shaped hills. They're often called whalebacks also because they kind of look like whales that are kind of breaching the water here. Um, they're really fun. Drumlins are teardrop shaped. If you look at them from above, they are long and narrow and the steep part of the hill here actually points to the direction that the ice came from. So in this area, the ice came from this general direction and moved south. And what happened was the ice traveled over a whole bunch of just glacial sediment that was totally unsorted and laying on the ground. It's called glacial till. And the till was sort of shaped from the base of the glacier into these teardrop shaped hills. Drumlins very often occur in what are called drumlin fields. And actually there's like world famous drumlin fields between Rochester and Palmyra, New York. And here's where you see some of these drumlin fields on a physiographic map. Down here is what they look like on a topographic map. And you can see there's a series of elongated narrow hills. And what you also notice is that the steeper part of these hills is to the north. And that's because um, the contour lines are closer together. So that indicates that they're steeper. In this direct, in this particular map, the ice moved pretty much due north to south in this part of Palmyra. Um, and what's fun is that this is Hill Camorra, which if you're not from Rochester, Hill Camorra is actually in Palmyra, New York. It is the tallest drumlin in the state. And Palmyra is also the birthplace of uh, the Mormon church, in fact. So it's kind of a fun factoid. Um, so that's how drumlins form. They're depositional features where till gets shaped into these teardrop shaped hills. And the steep side of the hill indicates the direction the ice was coming from. Another feature that is really common in Western New York are called kettles. So kettles are formed when chunks of ice break off of the front of glaciers. And typically when glaciers are starting to melt, they create a tremendous volume of melt water. That melt water accumulates at the front of a glacier. The other thing that happens when glaciers are receding is that big chunks of ice will break off from the front of the glacier or the terminus of the glacier. And those Kettles are created when large chunks of ice fall off of the terminus of a glacier and fall into a lake that is in front of it and they fall into the mud. Um, and what happens is that the ice kind of squishes down into the mud and creates a depression, kind of like you would if you stepped into like a, like a big mud puddle basically and you kind of, your foot got sort of sunk down into it. When all of the 
water eventually recedes, what's left is this small circular shaped depression um, called a kettle. And uh, kettles usually occur in groups. They also usually occur with this feature. Um, and this is a came. Cames are small sort of circular shaped hills. Uh, they can form in a couple different ways. Sometimes they form when you have streams that are flowing down the side of a glacier and those streams will be carrying water, or water certainly, but also sediment with them. So it'll accumulate in a pile on the side of a glacier and form these small little hills. The glacier eventually melts away, but the came or the hill will remain. Um, and sometimes cames can actually form from sediment on the top of a glacier. This is a picture of the South Island of New Zealand, which is characterized not by continental ice sheets, but by smaller glaciers that we'll learn about next. But what you see here is this is actually a glacier. Um, and you can see here that there's actually ice there. And the rest of this is just sediment. That sediment comes from the erosion of the valleys surrounding the glacier, and they just pile down on top of the ice. So I think a lot of times when we think of glaciers, because the Alaskan glaciers are beautiful, and because the Antarctic glaciers are just these spectacular sites, we forget that a lot of times glaciers are really dirty looking. Um, so what can happen is on the top of glaciers, you also have melting because the sun is beating down on the glacier and it'll create a small pond. That pond will also fill with sediment over time. And when the glacier finally melts away, that sediment again gets piled into a small hill called a cane. So again, just to review, there are four primary features that you find with continental glaciers. They are depositional in nature. They are all formed from sediment being deposited by glaciers. And those include drumlins, kettles, cames, and then the last one here is eskers. Eskers are winding ridges of sediment and they kind of look like a ridge uh, that is similarly shaped to a river. That's because eskers actually used to be rivers. So eskers form when there is a tunnel um, at the base of a glacier, a lot of times water will percolate down through glaciers and so will sediment to some extent. And there's sediment at the bottom beneath glaciers where the glacier touches the ground below. And that sediment and water will travel to the front or the terminus of a glacier in a river. That river will over time fill with sediment. And especially when you start to have a lake at the front of this, um, there will be more and more sediment that accumulates inside that river that is underneath a glacier, a subglacial river. When the river, when the, sorry, when the glacier melts away, the sediment from the river actually remains and it forms this long winding ridge of sediment that we call an esker. And again, it marks where there used to be a river beneath a glacier. And that's your fourth example of a, of a depositional feature formed by continental glaciers. So the second type of glacier that we're going to talk about are called alpine glaciers. They're also sometimes called valley glaciers, and that's because they form actually in river valleys. So these pictures, again, were taken on the South Island of New Zealand, and this is Mount Cook, which is the largest um, mountain in New Zealand. What you can see is th that's very different from what we see in rivers is that when glaciers come down valleys, um, they're not tight and V-shaped like we see where rivers are vertically eroding, they're actually more U-shaped, which you see here. And that's because those val the valley that we were standing in here was previously completely filled with an alpine glacier and it has since me melted back significantly and it's back here now. Um, but this whole valley was widened and deepened by an alpine glacier, which here you can see one. This one has a tunnel at the front and a river flowing out. Um, and you can see that there's again, a tremendous amount of sediment that's created from glacial erosion. And that's really our theme for when we look at um, features that are created by alpine glaciers, by valley glaciers, is that they're very much erosional features. Um, and here's just some more cool pictures for scale. There are a tremendous number of features, which I know you did for homework last week, um, that have to do with glacial erosion. And they include this one. This is a cirque, and a cirque is a sort of semi-circular shaped feature. It is an erosional sort of bowl shape or amphitheater shaped feature that it marks where there used to be the head of a glacier or the beginning of a glacier. So we use the word head of a glacier similarly to a river where you have the head of the river or the beginning of the river. 
So these pictures, most of them come from Glacier National Park, which is actually a very bad place to see glaciers. Um, they're very small there, and um, they by it's predicted by the year 2030 there'll be no glaciers in Glacier National Park. But regardless, um, you can see a fantastic glacial features. So this used to be the head of a glacier, which would fill this um, area, this round area that's now called a cirque, and that glacier would then flow down the slope here. So you, the word cirque sounds like circle, and it should. And if you look at the contour lines that surround this feature, um, they all again almost form a circle. Uh, almost form a circle. Um, so this is where a glacier used to be, and then it used to flow down this way. Here's a second cirque here. What you also notice is inside these cirques, there are features called there are small lakes, and those lakes are called tarns. Tarns are uh, lakes inside of cirques. And um, what ends up happening to students sometimes is they will confuse tarns and sinkholes and um, kettles. It's important to remember that tarns are inside of cirques. Sinkholes are in areas where there's karst topography. And kettles are in areas where there's kames, eskers, and drumlins. So again, this is a tarn, a lake inside of a cirque. Another feature that is typically found in alpine glacial regions is called a hanging valley. So this is actually um, called Birdwoman Falls at Glacier National Park. It's named after Sacagawea um, because Glacier National Park was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And um, what's true is that small little glaciers erode small little valleys and big thick glaciers will, uh, will erode big deep valleys. When those glaciers melt away though, what's left is a small valley that's hanging very far up on the wall of a deeper valley. And so very often you'll see waterfalls where you have um, hanging valleys or the contour lines are unbelievably close together. Um, and so, so that's exciting. Those are called hanging valleys. They're typically characterized by waterfalls, though not always. Another feature that is formed from glacial erosion in alpine glaciers is called an arete. Um, and those of you who took French in high school will remember that the word arete means stop. And that's because it, an arete is a knife-like ridge where glacial erosion stopped. So if you look at this photo, this valley used to be filled with a glacier and this valley used to be filled with a glacier. And look at here's a hanging valley there too. But this is where that glacial erosion stopped. Um, here is actually one of the arets that you'll actually look at in your lab today. This is the garden wall. Um, and here, this is a different aret in the same park. But um, when I visited Glacier National Park many years ago now, um, I was pregnant. And it's very hard to climb around in Rocky Mountains or in any mountains, really, um, when you are uh, pregnant with twins, which I was at the time. Um, so I, Professor Brown and I took a helicopter and we flew over a lot of these glacial features and this is in a ret. And so you can see it's really only a couple feet thick. Um, it really is like just a ridge of rock. Sometimes you will see very sculpted mountain peaks in glacial regions and those all are called horns. Horns have been eroded on multiple sides, so like one, two, three, four. This is the famous Matterhorn in Switzerland, um, and it is a great example of a glacial horn. You'll see plenty today. Another example of a glacial feature is called a coal. A coal is almost always labeled on a topographic map as a pass. So you will see in your map today, you will see Swiftwater Pass or Red Gap Pass. Um, those passes are all coals. Coals are basically places where there is a low point in a ridge. And so that's really important for navigation. If you've ever read or heard about the Donner Party, um, they died in a place called Donner Pass. They were early settlers and they were trying to cross the Rocky Mountains. They got caught in a storm in a coal because if you're trying to cross over mountains, you do not want to cross over this way when you can cross over this way. Um, and unfortunately, that uh, party was trapped by a storm for several months. Some of them died and then some of them resorted to cannibalism. It's a really heartwarming story if you've never heard it. Um, but yes, that's an example of a coal. So again, remember, coals are always going to be labeled as passes on your 
topographic map. So finger lakes are something that is very familiar to people who live in upstate New York, um, but these are not the only finger lakes in the world. Uh, they are really characteristic finger lakes though. Finger lakes are formed from glacial scour. So as the glacier is drifted south here, um, what they did is that portions of the glacier widened and deepened existing river valleys and like scraped the bottom of them, made them wider, deeper, and U-shaped, and dumped a whole bunch of sediment at the end of them, which kind of created a natural dam to keep the water in lakes. Um, here's actually an aerial photograph of Finger Lakes and Glacier National Park. Again, you see this same characteristic long, narrow shape. So this is yet another lake to kind of keep separate from kettles, tarns, and sinkholes, um, where Finger Lakes are very long and narrow, and again, formed by glacial scour, or which is kind of like abrasion or scrubbing, if you want to think of it that way. Some of my favorite lakes <laughs> are Paternoster Lakes. So Paternoster is actually Swiss, um, and it means our father, and that's because um, the Swiss and the French believed that these kind of looked like rosary beads or prayer beads. Um, and our father is a prayer that is frequently said with rosary beads. Um, so the reason is because Paternoster lakes are chains of lakes where you have a lake and then a stream and then another lake and a stream. And they're, so a series of lakes that are connected by streams. Um, they are beautiful, um, but they're also pretty, what they indicate is that this glacier moved in pulses. So it moved to here and then it stopped and eroded and then it slid down to here and stopped and eroded and created this lake, slid down to here, eroded and made this lake as well. Um, here's some more aerial photographs of Paternoster Lake. So there's a lake and a stream, a lake and a stream, lake, stream, lake. Um, here again is another series of Paternoster Lakes and right here, this is a horn and here is an arete, this knife-like ridge there. Very cool. All right. So those are the terms. There's lots of terms associated with glacial erosion. Um, but anyway, good luck and uh, enjoy, enjoy the map. All right.